begin. So good morning. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. I thank you for being here, especially given the current load shedding disruptions. I've certainly had an interesting morning. So my name is Preeta Bagaji and I'm a director at Cliftech Hoffmeyer in its technology, media and telecommunications practice. And I'm also the sector head for the firm's technology and communication sector. So the focus for today is, of course, fintech. And there are a raft of laws, legal issues, and many debates that span the breadth of fintech. So in today's session, we are specifically honing in on the massive growth in the fintech industry in Africa, with a focus on some key jurisdictions, including South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. Our aim is to provide a glimpse or a helicopter view, if you like, of the good, the bad and the legal in the fintech space. We will share some industry insights from a funding perspective by looking at the trends in funding and venture capital and focus on a few of the legislative and regulatory enablers in the space and also look at where these may hinder the growth of this industry and the broader digital economy. So with so much innovation in the fintech space and the proliferation of things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other developing technologies like the mind boggling applications for quantum computing and even quantum financial systems, many challenging legal questions arise, including in regard to the regulation of financial services, payment services, and credit products, and of course, data protection and cybersecurity continues to loom large in this space, along with leveraging the use of cloud, cross-border issues, tax, ex-con matters, competition, and anti-money laundering, to name just a few. Of course, IP is a very important consideration for any fintech business. And it's for this reason that we are hosting this webinar today in partnership with Spur and Fisher. So Spur and Fisher are the largest specialist IP law firm in Africa, and Cliff Decker and Spur and Fisher have partnered to form a strategic alliance to offer our clients end-to-end -end legal solutions. And in this space, it's in fact a perfect fit. Spur and Fisher have vast experience in advising fintechs and funders of all shapes and sizes across Africa in relation to IP. And this is complemented by Cliff Decker's breadth of fintech legal expertise. So just before I introduce you to the guest speakers for today, uh, a few housekeeping issues. So in case you do have connectivity issues, um, do not worry. We will share the recording of today's session with all of the attendees. And then also we would love to hear from you and encourage you to post any questions which you may have in the chat box. We set aside some time at the end for a Q&A session to respond to your questions. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speakers to you. First up, we have Max Kuvalier. So Max is a thought leader on the scale and growth of funding of the technology industry in Africa. He's passionate about innovation and entrepreneurship and the potential to address both local and global challenges. And he applies his passion to both his role as head of mobile for development at GSMA and to a company that's called Africa, the big deal. Max will be discussing the growth of the fintech industry and in particular focusing on funding of startups in Africa over the last few years and highlighting the biggest deals and players in this space. Thereafter, we'll hear from my fellow CDHA, John Gilmer. John is a leading financial services lawyer in South Africa and co-head of our private equity sector. Shem Otenga then is next, and he's a partner in our Kenyan office. He sits in the technology, media and telecommunications practice as well, and has a wide expertise in technology, communications, IP, data protection, and of course, FinTech. He's followed by Dina Biagio, who's a patent attorney and partner at Spur and Fisher. 
She's impressively studied, studied physics and electrical engineering and has almost two decades of IP experience. And she specializes in transactional and commercial IP work. So Dina will be discussing the most relevant IP rights considerations for fintech businesses um, this morning. She'll look at scale-ups and investors and consider what IP considerations are important during startup growth as well as the funding phases. And then we also have Miguel de Costa, who's joined us from a fintech. He is head of operations at Stitch. A, financial, a fintech company that operates in both South Africa and Nigeria, and they leverage the API infrastructure to enable financial products. Miguel looks after the legal and financial uh, functions at Stitch, and it includes how the group company manages its IP structure. So with that, I hand over to Max. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Preeta. Good morning, everyone. Um, so bear with me for a second while I share my screen. Hopefully, you can all see. And now you should also be able to see me. Please let me know, obviously, if you can't uh, see the slides. Um, thank you very much for, for having me this morning. Uh, so my name yes, is Max Cuvillier. By day, I lead Mobile for Development at the GSMA where we focus on leveraging digital technology to support the development of solutions that are both commercially sustainable and uh, that help address local, social, economic and climate related challenges. And we do research, we do advocacy, but also we de-risk projects on the ground and we've provided non dilutive capital to over 100 startups in our portfolio in the past few years. And in my free time, I play with the data that my friend Maxime uh, gathers on deals on the continent uh, in an experiment we've called Africa, the big deal. Um, it's a project born out of our admiration for the dynamism of the startup scene in Africa that's made up of a free targeted weekly newsletter, really short and straight to the point, and a comprehensive database of VC deals going back to 2019. Now, as I'm sure you've noticed, things have really heated up in the past couple of years. Think about it. Back in 2015, startups in Africa raised about $55 million collectively, according to Partech. In 2022, so far, we've got three startups who have already raised more than that in a single round. There's Clickertel in South Africa, $91 million. There's Instadeep in Tunisia, $100 million. And of course, Flutterwave, $250 million at a $3 billion valuation, which makes it the highest valued unicorn on the continent. In three words, what we've seen in the past few years is growth, growth, and more growth. Um, the growth is really impressive, in particular if you compare 2020 to 2021. Startups raised two and a half times more funding between 2020 and 2021 for a total of, uh, of around $4.3 billion. It's the equivalent of a million dollar raised every two hours throughout the week, uh, the year, not just a week. Um, it's more than 800 deals over $100,000, and it's 800, more than 800 unique investors involved in at least one deal on the continent. Um, of course, the vast majority of those investors are involved in just one or two deals, but some that you can see on this screen are extremely active and are branching out of what we call the big four. Talking of the big four, um, and here we're talking about Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, and Kenya. They are dominating the scene, as you can see on the map. They represent about 81% of the total amount raised in 2021. Nigeria alone attracted $1.5 billion in 2021. That's just below what the whole African ecosystem had raised in 2020. In South Africa, we're close to a billion dollars, $600 million in Egypt, $400 million in Kenya. So Nigeria, Egypt, and South Africa are the three largest economies in terms of GDP in this order. So it's quite normal to see them in the top four. Kenya, however, is really punching above its waist. It's only number seven in terms of GDP on the continent, but makes it to the top four um, in terms of uh, attractiveness and a number of deals. Beyond the big four, we've got 30 countries in total that have registered at least one deal over $100,000 in 2021. Which also means, if we look at the glass half empty, that 24 countries have seen no deal activity over $100,000 in 2021. 
So where are things heating up beyond the big four? Uh, you can see on the map, there's Morocco, there's Tunisia, there's Ghana, Tanzania, Uganda, that are showing really great activity. And there is, of course, Senegal as well, but that's mostly driven by one mega deal, so a deal over $100 million, and that's Wave's $200 uh, million Series A. Which takes me to my next point, the mega deals. They are on the rise, uh, big time, actually. We registered 12 mega deals in 2021 alone uh, for a total of uh, close to $2 billion. There were only three in 2019 and two in 2020. Now, um, I'll give you 10 seconds and I'd like you to think of how many of those deals you can name for from the top of your head in, uh, in 2021. I'll give you about 10 seconds while I get a sip of water. OK, I'm sure you got most of them, um, but here they are. So way more than money, of course. Opay, $400 million. That's the largest round ever on the continent. Andela, $200 million. Flutterwave, M&T Haaland, Jumo, Trade Depot, Time Bank, Palm Pay, MFS Africa, and two deals from cheaper cash. Now, if we go back to the list, listen to me. Wave Mobile Money, Opay, Time Bank, Palm Pay, cheaper cash, I think you, we all see a pattern here. And yes, nine of the 12 mega deals of 2021 were in fintech. In short, fintech is really dominating the fundraising scene in Africa. If we look like back in 2019, fintech was about 43% of the amount raised in Africa, just below $600 million. In 2020, this total had, raised, had reached over $800 million at just below half of the funding raised on the continent. Now wait for it, in 2021, from $800 million, we went to $2.3 billion, um, representing more than half of the funding raised on the continent that year. That number literally exploded. Those $2.3 billion, 37% uh, of this number is in Nigeria, and 29% of this number is in South Africa. So these two countries alone represent or, um, about two thirds of the fintech uh, funding raised in 2021. It's worth noting here that we're not attributing the $250 million raised by cheaper cash to a specific country. They have a Ghanaian and a Ugandan co-founders. Their African HQ is split between Ghana and Kenya. So the company does feel too Pan-African to pin it down to just one country. And I think this in itself is, is a trend. It's also worth noting the fact that fintech is really foundational to a lot of the other sectors, of course. We've got seven sectors in, in 2021 that raised uh, over $100 million, and most of them wouldn't really be able to strive without like credible payment options, for instance, whether they're coming from banks, from mobile money providers, or from fintech. Now, growth uh, and fintech are good, but it wouldn't be right not to acknowledge some of uh, um, the ugly, if I can say. Founders and CEOs of color, founders and CEOs educated on the continent, and female founders and CEOs are still massively underrepresented. Um, if we look very quickly at gender, for instance, of the $4.3 billion that was raised that were raised in 2021, 82% of that amount went to either single male founders or founding teams made of men only. And all of those teams had a male CEO. About 17%, $750 million went to like gender diverse founding teams. So either a team of men and a woman or a larger team with at least one woman. Which means if you do the math that female single founders and female only founding teams only raise $41 million. That's less than 1%. Um, I would say, unfortunately, that's crumbs, basically. If we look at CEO gender, um, the numbers are also appalling. 93%, that's over four out of $4.3 billion, went to startups with a male CEO. Therefore, only 7% went to startups with a female CEO. Now, a few important things to note here. No, it's not just an African problem. We're seeing it in the US, we're seeing this in, in, uh, in Europe and across the world. No, it doesn't mean that women are less successful than men, and you'd be shocked how many times I hear this argument. It doesn't mean either that investors are fully to blame. As we know, it's the result of biases and inequalities that are 
at many levels and that therefore need to be addressed also at many levels. And by the way, if you thought those numbers were bad, for fintech, they're even worse. In 2021, 99% of the funding uh, raised by fintech went to startups with a male CEO compared to 93% for the overall ecosystem. And 96% went to either a single male founder or an all-male founding team compared to 82% for the overall ecosystem. On the positive side, I would say this is a fantastic opportunity for whoever takes the time to identify talent off the beaten track. I see it's already time to wrap up, so a couple thoughts to finish. Um, the, couple, the, th the growth story that we've seen in the past three years is really impressive, but um, if we look at the beginning of 2022, it's, uh, it seems that there's a lot more to come. In 2022, it took only seven weeks um, for the ecosystem to raise its first billion dollars. That's three times faster than 2021, um, which was already faster than 2020 and 2019, obviously. Now, what does this mean for fintech in particular from a legal consideration point of view? A few thoughts. Um, the sector is attracting a lot of attention and there are more and more copycats and people trying to address the same issue. So protecting the IP is really key not just in one country, but also across borders. The second point is that larger deals and a wider range of investors means more complexity to navigate. So making sure that the deals are watertight gets more and more important. Third, uh, fintech deals are getting expensive for investors and other sectors might be more attractive. So investors are likely to be more cautious to make sure that the fintech they back is prepared for growth, for replication to new markets, and also to handle competition from new and established players. And my last point is on regulation. Compliance to local, re local regulation, especially in the final sector, is critical. And regulation, as we see, is often non-existent or not fit for purpose or evolving, but you shouldn't fool yourself. If you're onto something good, if your business is growing, the regulators will eventually notice. Now, I will stop here in the interest of time as we have more great presentations coming up. But if you want to find out more, check out our Substack for the monthly newsletter or the full database available on Gumroad and feel free to reach out directly to me, uh, of course. I will now hand you over to John Gilmer, who will discuss a few legal considerations much more eloquently than I did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Hopefully everyone can hear me and see me. Um, Heidi, if I might ask if you could or someone could share the slide for my section. We're getting it this. up now, John. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Max. Uh, it, was, it was a really interesting presentation. And I must say, uh, certainly putting my private equity hat on, um, you're absolutely correct. I mean, FinTech is definitely uh, where a lot of the private equity managers are looking to deploy capital. It's certainly a space in which they're able to raise capital. Um, and on the, uh, I guess, the negative points that you raised, uh, and quite rightly so, about a lack of diversity, both gender and, and in terms of uh, ethnicity, in terms of founders, uh, we've been involved this year with SAVCA, uh, the Private Equity and Venture Capital Association of South Africa, in two training sessions, which were specifically aimed at incubating and bringing uh, black owned uh, and, and specifically most recently black owned uh, uh, founders and managers into the market space in sub-Saharan sub Africa and uh, the, the people we've had on the course are just so incredibly impressive so I have no doubt we are going to see changes for the better um, in the industry in the future which which I think is a positive takeaway. Um, I'm going to move quickly into my section, which is the boring bit, regulation. Um, and that's why I have been given five minutes, I suspect, um, so that we don't land up losing a whole lot of additional uh, attendees. Uh, the short, the long and short of it is, and as Max uh, intimated, is regulation is coming. In fact, it's already here. Um, and specifically in a South African context, we've seen the migration towards the Twin Peaks uh, regulatory framework. Uh, that is now, I would guess to say, we're about halfway there. So in the last 18 months, we've seen 
the introduction of the Financial Sector uh, Regulation Act, FISRA. We've seen a new Insurance Act. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware with the introduction of proper data protection legislation under POPI. We've seen significant amendments to our um, KYC regulatory regime under FICA. Uh, but if you think we're just catching our breath now and, and compliance officers, I'm sure, are already overwhelmed. Uh, I hate to, to break the news to you. We, we only halfway there and, and there's a lot more coming in the pipeline. Um, in the Minister of Finance budget speech, he released a financial sector annex as part of the speech last month. And in it, he stated that uh, the Conduct of Financial Institutions Act, which is the second part of the Twin Peaks uh, regulatory framework, is due to be presented to Parliament in the first half of this year. In fact, it could even be in Q1, so, so watch that space. And that's going to be a significant piece of legislation. I mean, it's going to completely overhaul the financial services uh, sector. We can also expect uh, quite significant amendments to Regulation 28 of the Pensions Fund Act, which deals with uh, prudential restrictions for pension funds and how and where they can invest money. Um, and interesting there, they've included infrastructure, but infrastructure now doesn't just mean roads and bridges. In fact, it means IT infrastructure as well, which is a positive development. So we'll see uh, big institutional investors now climbing into the space. So again, to Max's point about growth, you know, expect to see our pension funds now being invested in the fintech space and in startups uh, through probably through VC and PE vehicles initially, uh, rather than direct investments. But that's a uh, an interesting development that's coming and a positive one in my personal opinion. Um, but it's not just the private sector that is 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 moving into fintech. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, unfortunately, whichever way you look at it, so are regulators. Um, th there's a concept now that's uh, that's entered the marketplace called subtech, SUP tech, and basically that that stands for supervisory tech. And we're already seeing this in several jurisdictions uh, across the world. Australia, for example, has a, a market intelligence system that monitors all trades. Um, automatically, it's, it's, it's all through artificial intelligence. And as soon as they see any on-market or off-market trades, which the IA system picks up as being unusual, um, it flags it for investigation. Um, and certainly the FSCA in South Africa is all over this um, and are intending to introduce similar type of fintech in the regulatory space, which is quite an interesting development that we need to keep our, our eyes out on. Uh, I'll start for um, moving along, and I wanted to make two last comments before my time runs out. Um, is I think we can also expect to see significant more focus on ESG, um, environmental social governance, uh, even in the context of financial services and fintech itself. Um, you know, quoting from the managing director of a, of a leading uh, asset manager in South Africa. I'm delighted to say a black female asset manager, and, and if I might quote Fatima Vada, she says, um, if you're an asset manager and you do not integrate ESG in your evaluation process of underlying assets, you simply won't have a seat at the table. And I think she's right. Um, and we see this from the biggest institutions, institutional investors, as they uh, DFIs, pension funds, uh, whenever I set up a private equity fund now, uh, ESG is is right up front, um, and it's. Uh, I think if if you would ignore it at your peril. Last but not least, in the South African context, and and maybe this to some extent addresses some of the 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 negative issues that were identified by Max, is transformation. So we've already seen amendments. Um, to the Insurance Act and FISRA, which I mentioned early, earlier, which spe specifically speak to transformation and the advancement of the objectives under the financial sector BE code. Um, the FSCA published a document for public comment called the Strategy for Supporting Financial Sector Transformation um, as recently as 1 March, so in other words, 10 days ago, which is a very interesting document and I'm very happy to share it with with everyone uh, on this on this webinar, 
But in essence, what the FECA is saying is that they, what, what the, what the the uh, legislators, sorry, are saying is they're going to look to the regulators, namely the Prudential Authority and the Conduct Authority, the FECA, to implement transformation. And you might ask, well, how would they do that? Well, as part of the financial sector code, you know, every business that's licensed in that area is required to have a, a transformation plan. And to the extent it is determined that your plan is insufficient or there's a lack of adherence to the plan, what is going to happen is the FECA itself as the regulator is going to be given administrative powers to penalize um, players in the market. And that penalization might take the form of fines or penalties, but at its most extreme, uh, it could actually result in the suspension of uh, your regulatory licenses, which goes from everything to banking, insurance, asset management, administration, really across the board. So if you, in short, if you need a license to do your particular activity in the South African marketplace and you don't have a transformation plan or you are not adhering to it, you need to pay very careful attention to this legislation, which is very shortly about to uh, be enacted. Um, I've covered a heck of a lot in hopefully vaguely within my time limit. Uh, so I apologize if I've sort of sped through things, but please feel free to ask questions um, at the end. If I might hand over to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John, um, for those thoughts on on um, South African law and regulation in respect of um, the fintech space. Um, I'll now just come in to give a bit of color and context um, from a more regional perspective, um, starting with Kenya as a comparative jurisdiction, but you know, I'll also say a thing or two um, about a few other jurisdictions. Um, Nigeria and Egypt um, being hubs, as Max had mentioned earlier, um, for fintech development, um, investment, and even now regulation. Um, so, just to move um, on, not sure if my my slides are, are working. I can share them for you, uh, Shem. Yeah. Yeah, if you could do that, please, I'd be grateful. Yeah, so if you could move to the second slide, um, Heidi, I'd be grateful. So basically, just a quick overview. Um, some of the the areas um, or some of the features of, of the Kenyan fintech environment, um, digital lending. Um, is one of the more prominent ones and the subject of regulation, as I'll mention um, a bit later. But um, lots of digital lending um, service providers um, currently um, very active in the Kenyan fintech space, um, leveraging on credit scoring algorithms and um, using that to offer credit through mobile phone um, systems. Um, again, we've seen digital banking traditionally uh, being one of the earlier forms of uh, fintech being employed uh, within this space, enabling customers to access um, their accounts within the traditional banking system, but through digital means. Um, payment gateways, I guess, um, again, an earlier form of fintech um, through the more traditional MasterCard and Visa avenues, but again, more innovatively through M-Pesa, which is a mobile, which started out as a mobile money transfer um, system, but has then sort of evolved into uh, many other uh, features, um, including uh, payment services um, and the like, and, and even um, a form of credit. Um, more recently. Then there's InsurTech, again, giving stakeholders within the insurance um, sector access to 
you know, their providers, um, their information, in, uh, including premium statements, um, tracking claims, and the rest all through digital means and, and mobile money transfers, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, on to the next slide, uh, Heidi, before you go, actually, um, uh, quickly just positioning about where Kenya is um, in, in the scale of things. And Max mentioned that we're pretty much punching above our weight um, at number 31, up from um, up from number 42 last year under the Findexable Global Fintech Fintech rankings. And Nairobi as a hub also punching pretty much above its weight, 26 positions up this year, last year as opposed to 2020. Um, again, spurred by a number of things, um, which the next slide um, sort of um, gives a bit of insight on. Collaboration is a great feature um, of the fintech space within Kenya between MNOs, mobile network operators, and, and entities within the fintech space and traditional banking institutions. Um, the local and a global investment um, has been on the rise and that has fueled um, the growth of the growth and the profile of the Kenyan fintech space. Max spoke a bit to that. Um, a keen feature again, um, a peculiarity of Nairobi um, as a fintech hub is the enabling HR environment where there's lots of interest in computer science, um, software development, and um, factors that feed into the digital aspects of fintech and, and have fueled or driven growth in that space. COVID-19 had the same effect here that it had everywhere. The central bank in March of 2020 issued um, guidelines or directives to um, encourage the use of um, digital payment solutions over um, actual currency um, as a COVID-19 containment measure. And so that had its spillover effect on, on the growth of, of fintech. Um, internet penetration and, and general demand also add or pour into um, the growth that we've experienced. And of course, um, um, the regulatory environment um, has been pretty positive. And the next slide um, would give a bit of insight onto that. So for the longest time, we haven't had a separate standalone um, um, legal regime for, for fintech and the law has pretty much observed um, innovation happening and, and allowed it to run before stepping in to sort of um, regulate and draw parameters for what needs to happen. Uh, in, in 2019, the Capital Markets Authority issued um, a guidance note on the setting up of a, of a regulatory sandbox for players within uh, the capital market space um, and a few players were admitted into, into um, the sandbox. Uh, the first successful exit happened in October of 2020 um, with, with an entity operating within the debt um, uh, and crowdfunding space, um, getting the first no objection from, from uh, the Capital Markets Authority and successfully exiting it. Hopefully, um, a few other uh, of the players within the sandbox will be exited this year, and, and that has been a remarkable success story in my view. Um, but onto more structured regulation, um, and, and this really has been, in my view, the first solid um, codified, dedicated, if I would say, amendment to the law um, in relation to the fintech space is the Central Bank of Kenya Amendment Act, which came into force on 23rd of December last year, essentially um, bringing digital credit providers uh, under the purview of the Central Bank um, and requiring um, them to obtain licensing from the Central Bank of Kenya um, and, and also as part of the licensing process uh, to be very importantly incorporated within Kenya um, to provide the certificate of incorporation, to be registered with the data uh, commissioner within Kenya. Um, the data commissioner was set up um, sometime um, last year. Her office was set up last year and she's still operationalizing the process. Implementing regulations came into force this year. And so the process of um, registration um, is being rolled out very slowly. Um, so thankfully, the amendments to the Central Bank of Kenya Act bringing fintech players in the digital credit service provider space under the purview of the CBK. Um, well, those, those requirements will kick in um, gradually with an effective date um, of um, 
23rd September as a deadline for when applications for licensing need to be put in by players within within that space. Um, regulations implementing um, those amendments uh, that bring the digital credit service providers under the ambit of the CBK are expected by the 23rd of this month. Um, that's a statutory deadline that has been put in place. Um, the draft regulations were circulated, feedback has been obtained, and so we expect that um, that timeline um, will be maintained um, by, uh, by the central bank, even in the issuance uh, and, and the minister responsible in the issuance of those regulations. Uh, on to the next slide, um, I'll speak a little bit about Nigeria. Again, you know, the giant, I guess, in Africa in relation to fintech from an investments perspective. Um, also seen a, a deluge so to speak, of regulation coming in in 2020, 2021 in relation to payment systems, um, payment systems and services, uh, in relation to payment service banks, uh, most notably um, the launching of a CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, ENIRA, the first um, in Africa. Uh, haven't seen this anywhere, but likely to be adopted um, in different jurisdictions um, following Nigeria, including Kenya, where the central bank um, has issued um, a note uh, on the same and therefore we expect to see traction along those lines in Kenya as well with time. Um, again, banks and other financial institutions act passed at the end of 2020 in Nigeria, um, brought fintech corporations under the umbrella and purview of the central bank of Nigeria. So again, the point here is that Together with the growth in investments is a growth in, in legislation and um, a very good approach is being taken across the board through the uh, setting up of sandbox operations in, in Kenya, in Nigeria as well, um, and as we later on see in Egypt as well, to sort of test out these innovative products, see how they're working, have them run in a controlled environment with regulatory oversight subject to conditions and safeguards from the regulators and then once uh, the regulator is satisfied that you know they're fit for purpose and you know uh, can be rolled out safely to the public then um, that is done and regulations are put in place um, to, to govern that so same thing in egypt um, on the next slide um, the banking fintech law number five of 2022 was approved um, just last month Again, the financial regulatory authority in that country now becomes the sole licensor and regulator um, for fintech entities um, that offer digital financial solutions, including robo advisory, nano finance, insure tech, and, and tech enabled consumer finance. Um, again, a similar requirement to what we've seen in Kenya is a requirement to incorporate um, locally in Egypt and apply for licensing from the FRA um, and, and penalties are also um, attached to that for failure, just like in, in Kenya. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the sandbox approach and a temporary license regime has been adopted under this law in Egypt. So um, in my view, a fairly reasonable approach towards regulation, one that is balanced, that is careful not to stifle innovation, but at the same time um, looking out for the public interest to ensure that the public um, is, is well protected and, and the entire sector is stable, even as regulation is introduced. Um, so with those few remarks, I'll, I'll pass over to, to my colleague from SPOR, uh, Dina Biagio, um, to give us a little bit of insight on the IP implications uh, of this subject. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Shem. I'm just going to <coughs> put my video on and share, share my screen. You'll bear with me. There we go. I hope everybody can see that um, can see that presentation. Um, hi, everyone. Um, over the next 10 minutes, I hope to convince you of the importance of, of IP for any fintech business, whether you're a, a small startup, a scaling business, or, or an investor. Um, I won't have time to go into too much detail, um, but please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or drop me a mail afterwards if you'd like to have any more detailed information. Um, so... Um, fintech businesses obviously employ a variety, a wide variety of different technologies, but if we look for the moment just at artificial intelligence, it's been piquing our interest since about the 
50s. But as Max pointed out earlier in relation to the amount of investment in, in these businesses, it's evolved from a relatively academic field to the subject of intense commercial interest. And we see this reflected in the IP landscape as well. So a 2019 study commissioned by WIPO reports that the ratio of scientific papers to patented inventions decreased from 8 to 1 in 2010 to 3 to 1 in 2016. And more than half of all patent applications in this field were filed after 2016. So it's not surprising then that IBM and Microsoft, these are two of the most prolific patent filers, are reported to have together owned more than about 40,000 FinTech patents a couple of years ago. Um, and this number has risen significantly since. Some of the world's other big FinTech patent filers are PayPal, Visa, Bank of America, um, and MasterCard. Um, we've also seen increased IP litigation in the fintech space. So, for example, we have the 2021 case of, of Boom Payments um, versus Stripe and Sh Shopify. Um, that was for infringement of a so-called so electronic payment escrow system um, involving the release of payment after only after certain conditions have been met. Um, and in Australia, we've seen um, infringement of the Pay ID trademark by Ripple Labs, um, which we'll get to in a little while. So as with any emerging technology field, players have, have certainly started to appreciate the importance of IP to their business. And this is not surprising, given that the largest chunk of their value is probably attributable to intangible assets. So in the short time available today, we'll be focusing on the key IP considerations for fintech businesses and for investors. First off, it's important to appreciate that you may not have a patent or a patentable invention, but you will always have some form of intellectual property and often a mix of IP types is what will provide this protection. So for example, your branding could be trademarked, that would be your name, logo, or slogan. Um, you may have copyright in software that is used to establish an online platform or maybe software for database management or for you know, processing, cleaning or, or analyzing um, information. Um, then uh, there's also compilations of data and in certain circumstances, even the individual data items will form the subject of, of copyright protection. Um, and then you may have rights in algorithms or processes, formula, um, you know, risk matrices, pretty much any technical or business information that is not um, generally known. Um, so, so it might be that you have, uh, you know, an invention, something that's novel, a system or method that's novel and inventive and, and can be patented. For, for fintechs globally, we've seen that patent filings are primarily in the field of cybersecurity, um, in banking and payment industries, mobile uh, transactions, data analytics, and increasingly um, relating to, to blockchain. So who owns this IP? Um, generally speaking, ownership stems from creatorship. So if you or your employees have created it, you will own it. Um, but you will not own IP merely because you have paid for someone else to, to create it or because you expect a problem that somebody else then solved for you. Um, so our advice to businesses is, is to exercise careful control over the development of your products um, and take written assignments of all IP created by contractors who've been commissioned to create. Um, a portfolio of registered IP is certainly a nice to have um, at the outset, but, but for many businesses, it can be quite expensive to, um, to obtain. Uh, in most countries, you need to apply for patent rights before the invention is used commercially or, or publicly disclosed. And, and conversely, um, you know, applications for trademark applications can be filed at any time. But of course, these will only proceed to registration if the mark is available on the register. So our advice is, is, to, um, is to stretch a, a small IP budget to cover the most important forms of IP at the appropriate time. Um, at least conduct a search and file for protection for your core trademarks in your most important territories. And um, you know, this should provide some comfort that you'll be free to use those marks um, in the territories. This leads us to the next point, um, the freedom to operate. So having focused on your own IP, you will then need to stop for a moment and consider the IP of others. 
in practice, we see quite a common misconception that one is always free to use one's own IP. <laughs> in fact, there may be many reasons why you can't do this. For example, your product might fall within the scope of claims of, of another broader patent owned by somebody else. Um, you know, you may be obliged to comply with um, the terms of an open source license, which often requires distribution of, of amended code. Um, and your product may source information or inputs in which third parties have rights. Um, you know, this could be rights of, of data subjects, if it's personal information um, or, you know, information that's been compiled by, by somebody else. Um, you know, the bottom line is if your product relies on a village, you need to obtain licenses from all the villages. Um, and even if you have licenses in place with all the rights holders that you know of, you may still infringe a patent that you did not know exists. So since patents and trademarks are, are territorial, um, you know, non-infringement in one country does not mean that you will have freedom to operate in another country. And it's therefore very important to limit warranties to conscious infringement of unregistered IP only to the extent that that's possible. Then on to IP management. Um, you know, the management of unregistered IP is often overlooked. Um, it should be properly managed if you consider its potential to impact on your business. So, so for example, if your business relies on a series of, of secret algorithms, um, you know, these should be treated like prized possessions. Um, then you also need to create a clear distinction in the minds of your employees between their skill and experience um, and the information that your business considers to be its proprietary know-how. Um, we often find in find in practice that um, that there can be some um, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a blurred line there. Um, we recommend that you comprehensively document your know-how. You can't afford to lose this know-how when, when personnel terminate their employment and a new employer should not receive the benefit of IP that you paid to be developed. So um, so, and just as importantly, if you codify your know-how, you'll be in a position to prove the existence of your rights if that IP is unlawfully transferred to or used by others to your detriment. Um, and lastly, when enforcing your unregistered rights, you'll need to prove that a defendant's actions amount to copying or, or misappropriation. So, so in practice, where a defendant has copied a fictitious database entry or an obscure remark line, for example, in, in software, um, in code, he will have difficulty in rebutting an, an allegation of copying. So, so fingerprinting or watermarking your IP in this way can be key to, to catching an infringer in the act. For investors, um, we'd like to highlight the following. Firstly, the value of IP does not necessarily equal the value of the business or the value of the technology, even as a as a broad concept. Um, you know, IP by definition is is the a right that entitles the proprietor to prevent others from using. So the value of technical IP is determined by its ability to do this. So a copyright in software, for example, does not prevent a competitor from independently redeveloping software with precisely the same function for the same purpose. So, so in the case of copyright in software, its value will often approximate the cost of redevelopment. Um, you know, for the value of a patent, on the other hand, um, you know, would depend on factors such as the scope of the claims, um, the competitive landscape and the existence of, of possible, um, you know, potential licensees, the ability to detect and prevent infringement, just uh, to name a few of those. And until now, we've spoken largely about technical IP, but the impact of a trademark cannot be overstated. Um, particularly if technical IP is thin. In other words, a business has no patents, no databases inf information or secret algorithms. Um, you know, the business will rely on its trademarks to stand out from the crowd and, and to attract trade. So your trademark is the tool with which you communicate directly with your customers. Um, and it becomes a, a brand promise that creates an expectation in the minds of your customers. So, for example, if you use SnapScan or Paygate, you expect a certain level of, of security and, and efficiency. Um, so how do you choose a name that is so important? Um, you know, firstly, a trademark should distinguish the name of your business or your products from those of competitors. So the most important attributes of any trademark is that it's capable of distinguishing. Um, 
And the more appropriate a word is for describing the products or services, the less capable it will be of distinguishing. Um, and even if it was possible to register a sort of semi-descriptive word, um, you know, you can never prevent um, competitors from using identical descriptive terms. So, um, so you need to, you know, you need to stay away from the descriptive uh, descript descriptive terms um, as as trademarks. Um, also, you'll want to choose a mark that can be registered. So we recommend you conduct a, a search to ensure that it's available for registration, and also to ensure that you're not infringing somebody else's, you know, mark that's already been registered. Um, and then, lastly, on this point, you know, trademarks acquire value through exposure. So, so quite simply. The more visible a mark is, the more potential it has to become valuable. Um, and a trademark is made visible through advertising, um, you know, the accessibility of the products or services or the distribution. And sometimes in the case of PayPal, for example, through the sheer size of its share of the market. Um, but until your mark reaches PayPal status, you will need to invest in, in building it up. So this should form part of any business plan. Um, then lastly, when considering the expansion of a business, bear in mind that registered IP is territorial in nature, so it's not possible to register a worldwide patent or, or a worldwide trademark. Um, these items need to be applied for and prosecuted and registered in each territory of interest. And the territoriality of patent rights is, is quite hard to reconcile with cloud-based systems and methods. Um, you know, so, so in the olden days, a patent would be sort of clearly infringed if the patented invention is made, used, exercised, sold, advertised, or imported into the country in which the patent exists. But nowadays, um, it's it's not so simple. When it comes to web accessible or cloud-based inventions, how do you determine whether the structural elements of the system, or um, you know, or the method steps are carried out in the patent country? Um, so this concept has not been tested in South African courts, but we, we've take, taken guidance from European decisions. They've, they've generally held that every step of a method claim and every element of a system claim do not need to be carried out or located in the patent country. Um, so a defendant could exercise, let's say, a patented method between mobile phones or customer terminals um, in a patent country with their, their server located in a, in a patent-free country. And in, you know, in, in these circumstances, both German and UK courts have held that the claimed method is used in the patent country, um, you know, uh, even well, where, the, where the terminals or the, the mobile phones are located, even though they communicate with the defendant server outside of the patent country. And similarly, you know, offshoring subsystems is not going to um, enable you to bypass patent protection. Um, and just as your own IP is territorial, so too should you investigate freedom to operate on a country by country basis. If you expand a fledgling business into a new country, you may be surprised to find that you are now infringing third party IP, um, even though you didn't have this problem previously. And this is actually precisely what happened in um, in the case of, of Ripple Labs. It's, it's a US blockchain company, and it expanded its offering into Australia under the Pay ID trademark. And evidence soon came to light that customers were um, were incorrectly assuming that there was an association between its services and those offered by um, the NPPA, which is an industry collaboration, including 13 of Australia's largest banks. Um, and this actually resulted in, in, in Ripple having to rebrand to, to Paystring in Australia. Um, and then finally, on the topic of expansion, um, a quick reminder that South Africa has exchange control regulations. Um, and um, you know, this controls the outflow of, of IP and rights to IP uh, from the country. So both the assignment and the licensing of South African owned IP will require um, XCON approval. Um, and a key consideration in this regard is, of course, whether software is being provided as a service to a foreigner or whether a license under intellectual property is, strictly speaking, being granted to a foreigner. Of course, an IP license is only required if the licensee would be infringing in the absence of the license. But, but nevertheless, it would be prudent to bear the XCON regs in mind when structuring um, the expansion of a software-based business. Um, so in conclusion, um, I, I hope I have managed to convince you um, that IP has the ability to materially impact your business and its growth. Um, I'll now hand over to Miguel da Costa. He's the head of operations at Stitch. And for those of you who may have joined late, Stitch is a homegrown 
fintech startup that last year secured $4 million um, dollars in investment to consolidate its growth in South Africa and to launch its operations uh, into the rest of Africa. Over to you, uh, Miguel. Thanks. Thanks, Dina. Uh, and I think we'll be doing a, a Q&A with Teresa. <clears throat> yes, yes, and thank you, Miguel, for joining us. I'm very excited to be discussing um, with you the on, the on the ground practicalities of um, all of the legal considerations and in particular the IP structuring question that we've just heard about. So perhaps for, for the audience, if um, Miguel, you could start with um, talking about um, how Stitch came about and, um, and the products and services you offer. Yeah, for sure. Happy to. And just apologies in advance if I'm a bit cro croaky. Um, I did test positive for COVID yesterday, unfortunately, but I, I couldn't miss this. Um, but just apologies if I am a little bit croaky. Uh, but as a, as a quick intro, a quick background to Stitch, um, we're an API fintech company that enable businesses to more quickly and easily build, optimize and scale uh, fintech products across Africa. Um, we offer a data and a payment solution uh, that dramatically reduce the effort required for businesses to connect to their users' financial accounts and to enable payments, uh, specifically bank-to-bank -bank payments, uh, without leaving the existing app infrastructure. Um, so if that probably didn't make sense at all, um, for those who don't understand what an API is, um, it's essentially, uh, it's, a, it's a part of infrastructure, app infrastructure, that connects apps and websites to each other. Um, so a nice kind of example, uh, I'll give you a bit of the founding story very briefly. Um, we initially started off as um, a peer-to-peer -peer payments app, very similar to, to Chipper Cash uh, or Venmo in the US. Um, if you know you wanna send money over to a friend or you wanna send money um, to family members in, in Nigeria or Kenya, uh, that was kind of the idea. While building that out, we found that it was it was really really difficult to connect uh, your bank accounts um, and and connect card. Um, but you know, building that out, we actually realized um, something had been built there that that connection to the bank, um, and that's where kind of Stitch uh, came from or was was birthed. Um, we want to enable the the enablers essentially, so enable other fintechs like Chipper Cash um, to to kind of uh, be able to, to scale and grow quickly. Great, thank you, Miguel. Um, so, so just in terms of the IP in particular, can you um, tell us a little bit about the IP and and then particularly the IP structuring and um, how you went about that? Yeah, so in, in our particular case, um, we uh, I think it depends what you're optimizing for. Um, we were optimizing for, for ease of investment. Um, so we have a, a US uh, holding company, Stitch, uh, um, Stitch USA, um, and that wholly owns the, the South African entity and the, the Nigerian entity. Um, and that, that, you know, different startups take different approaches. Like a lot of them um, have hold codes in, in the Netherlands. Um, for us, we really just wanted to make it really easy for, for investors um, to understand and be able to in, invest in the company. Um, and so that's why we went with that route. Um, and as such, um, again, it depends on, on who your investors are, but for the most part, uh, PayPal, for example, um, was very adamant that IP had to sit in the US. Um, and so we've structured things so that the IP sits within the, the US Holco um, and the, the sovereign NC essentially provides services uh, to the U.S. company. Great, thank you. Um, um, Miguel, unfortunately, we have run out of time, and so I wonder if, if um, you could give us some parting shots in terms of any learnings, advice, um, or, or reflections for other fintech startups or, or scale-ups out there. Yeah, for sure. I, I think the biggest one would be just to think about IP very early on um, and get in, you know, uh, professional advice around it. Um, so I think we did it fairly early. We probably could have done it even earlier, um, working, you know, quite closely with CDH to make sure we had 
uh, had everything um, uh, put in place there. Um, but yeah, biggest thing I'd, I'd say is, you know, make sure you have it um, have it done early on, because uh, later on, if, if you don't have the, the fundamentals in place, uh, I can come back to, to bite you. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Miguel. That, that was quite um, interesting insights. Um, I do see there are some questions uh, posted. Thank you. Um, so um, what we will do uh, is that um, we will we will have the experts. I think the questions are directed at Spur and Fisher. We'll have the experts write responses to um, to those questions and post it to all the attendees. Um, uh, given that we're out of time and it is a pity, uh, I would like to, in closing, uh, thank all the speakers as well as all of uh, the attendees for joining today. It certainly has been a very interesting and thought provoking discussion. We've only really scratched the surface. And on that note, we ask that you watch the space uh, for more insights and views from us um, on this fascinating area. And so thank you very much for your time. And I do hope that you each have a wonderful day.